So I guess I get to do my best Larry King this morning, right? And uh, yeah, you, you've seen him a few times. Uh, yes. Um, the two of you have built a friendship over many decades of ministry, co-laboring and uh, fighting some of the, the same battles, uh, the battle for the Bible. And uh, I believe it was uh, around the inerrancy struggles in the 70s, Dr. MacArthur, that you first became aware of Dr. Sproul's ministry. Uh, recount for us just some of those early impressions of uh, meeting Dr. Sproul. I think uh, the, the first exposure I had to RC was actually listening to the series on the holiness of God, and that's probably true for many, many uh, people here. Um, I, I had none of his name, uh, but, but that was my first real acquaintance. Uh, and that's really the entry point, I think, uh, for, for many people into the ministry of R.C. Sproul. And then uh, the Inerrancy Congress came along, and there were a hundred people that were involved in that, and uh, obviously he, he was there. I don't remember having personal contact at that point with him, but I knew he was a co-belligerent on the issue of biblical authority and inerrancy, and, and that is the watershed for absolutely everything. Um, I, uh, I, f I began to listen more often to him and follow his ministry, and then out of the absolute blue, I received an invitation to come to a Ligonier conference. And I was kind of an alien to the Reformed world, uh, to be honest. I sort of found my way to, to the right theology on my own. I, I wasn't raised in that environment. I was raised as kind of a devotional Baptist uh, guy and just kind of a traditional, typical middle-of-the-road uh, church. So I, I struggled on my own to find my way into Reformed uh, literature, Puritan reading, and once I, I, I read, um, I began to listen to Sproul and I read Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God by J.I. Packer, and, and, and this opened up kind of new world for me. But my first recollection of really spending time with him was at a Ligonier conference, and I don't even remember what year it was. Dr. Sproul? Hello. Do you remember inviting Dr. MacArthur to that conference, and do you remember <clears throat> meeting him there? Yes. <laughs> I'm guessing this is on the heels of Gospel According to Jesus a few years after that. I mean, look at that face. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite nickname for John when I first met him was Boris. Yeah. It was back at the time when Boris Yeltsin got up on a tank. Yeah. Remember that, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. He goes, uh, that's what I, the way I looked at John. Every time there was a battle that needed to be fought, John was out front. He was the one you wanted in your foxhole with you because uh, he was so valiant uh, for the truth and for the kingdom of God. And that's been his signature as long as I've known him. And uh, so, yeah, I, I remember meeting him at the uh, Congress on the Bible in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, um, you introduced me, the, I think, the first time I came to, to a Ligonier conference as Boris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you have seen ebbs and flows within the American Christian church and even in the church as it expands around the world. And a question comes from one of our attendees as asking if you could comment on what you see as the largest problem in the American church, uh, so geographically located here in America. What do you think is one of the biggest problems facing us in the American church? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think it's clearly a lack of biblical knowledge, a lack of biblical discernment. Um, the church basically suffers from spiritual AIDS. It could die of a thousand heresies because its immune system is so totally deficient um, that there's an inadequate understanding of the nature of God, an inadequate understanding of the nature of Christ. You have, for example, a classic illustration of that, um, one of the politicians standing alongside the, the clerk in Kentucky and holding her up as a Christian, and she's a denier, an overt denier of the Trinity. Uh, I, I think starting with God, starting with Christ, starting with the authority of Scripture, um, basically 
Christianity suffers, as I said, from the lack of discernment, spiritual aids, and, and, and it, can, it can die from a thousand heretical diseases. So the proclamation of the truth, the clarity with which the truth is proclaimed, the precision with which the truth is proclaimed and supported uh, at, at every level, this has been the hallmark of this man's ministry, uh, to, to proclaim the truth and to support the truth through, screason, to, through Scripture and reason. Uh, this is the greatest need of the church, and, and you all who are sitting out here, most all of you have come out of that sort of bl bland, vanilla kind of undefined Christianity, and once you began to see the truth with precision, you just locked onto it, and it is, it's the most precious thing that you have. That, that is the great need in the church today, that kind of precision, and it's not going to come to the church until it comes to the leadership of the church. Uh, because like people, like priests, as Hosea said, they're not going to rise any higher than their leadership. The question was to both of you, Dr. Sproul. <clears throat> I don't see how I could add anything significant to what John's already said. We live in the same environment, and we face the same problems uh, uh, every day. Forty-some uh, years ago, somebody asked me what I thought was the biggest problem in the church today, and I said, I think that the biggest problem in the church today is that we don't know who God is. And uh, that f f flows over into every other dimension. When I used to teach uh, systematic theology in the seminary, and I would taught, teach the doctrine of God, <clears throat> I would always begin by saying to our students that if you look at the various denominations historically, even Rome has a, basically a, a, a unanimous view of the nature and character of God, we all affirm that He's immutable, eternal, and omnipotent, and omniscient, and all of that. And there's very little difference, anything, nothing particularly unique about the Reformation and Reformed doctrine of God. And I said, and yet at the same time, paradoxically, if you would say what is most distinctive about Reformed theology, it's our doctrine of God. And they said, well, how can that be when we say we agree with everybody else? And I said, because when you turn to page two of systematic theology, we haven't forgot what we said on page one about the character and nature of God, where most other uh, denominations forget whatever they've affirmed about the nature of God as soon as they go on to the nature of man, the nature of Christ, and, and all the rest. It's a Trinitarian uh, gospel, and what we are defending is not simply a, a niche of Reformed theology, but we're dealing with classical Orthodox Christianity. That's what's at stake here. Question comes, why are there so few Reformed and Evangelical churches? Uh, for the same reason that there are so few people who understand the truth. Uh, look, Christianity is, is divided into s segments. Um, there is a dominant segment of evangelicalism, let's just take evangelicalism as defined, there's a dominant segment of evangelicalism that is wrapped up in what we would call the experiential charismatic kind of movement. Um, they're, they're completely adrift in terms of theology, the hermeneutics that are necessary to rightly interpret the Word of God. Um, that, that movement starts in 1900 in Topeka, Kansas, and it explodes into what we know as the charismatic movement today. There's, there's a parallel to that. There is a sentimental movement. The, the largest, uh, the, the largest um, volume booksellers in America are sentimentalistic preachers. There's a really interesting dissertation, and it, it turned into a book called Homespun Gospel. You, you should read it. It's an Oxford dissertation. And it's a study of the writings of Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, and Max Lucado, which are the defining, re the defining writers in what is a sentimentalistic view. This is a, this is a fast-moving, exploding kind of, kind of evangelicalism, if you can say that. They, they, they take up most of the space in the bookstore. So, so, but at the same time, we have to say we're seeing the greatest… I think the greatest explosion of Reformed theology in the history of the world because of technology. It's spread over the globe. It's, it's everywhere on the planet. Uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged on the one hand that this is getting out. It's, it's everywhere. It's all over the world thanks to ministries like Ligonier's and particularly Ligonier's ministry uh, and others. 
So these are great days for Reformed theology. Look, when I was in seminary, I knew one Reformed church in, in the whole region of Southern California went, where I went to s seminary, and it was a tiny little OPC church with a bunch of Calvinists in black suits contemplating their Calvinistic navel. They were just this sort of ingrown little tiny group. Th this wouldn't have happened. But that was in the 18th century when you were in seminary. No, that was not the 18th century. <laughs> Might have been better in the 18th century, but <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know anything about that. So I, I think you're seeing, hopefully this is going to continue to flourish globally, there's an explosion of this. But at the same time, there are parallel universes in evangelicalism um, that are troublesome. I mean, there's obviously the liberals, and, and, but the, the sentimentalists and the charismatics have a massive impact. And consequently, you get a kind of evangelicalism that can be syncretistic and mixes a little bit of everything. So you get some people who have a little bit of Reformed theology and, and a little bit of experiential theology and a little bit of sentimentalism kind of all mixed together. To clear it all out is going to take, a, uh, it's going to take the, the, the work of God to spread the truth through, I think, continuing generations of faithful men like R.C. Sproul. By the way, Chris, uh, while we're up here, we're being photographed for the media here, John. And I just want you to know you're being photographed by the most beautiful photographer I've ever seen in my life. Right, right now. <laughs> she ought to be on the other end of the picture. <laughs> She's also my granddaughter. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I have a face for radio. What's the missing ingredient in preaching today? <clears throat> Substance, and I, I'm really one who's uh, very excited about the renewal and revival of expositional preaching. And uh, <clears throat> John has been a model of that for decades, of course, where we go to the Word of God and we, we want to hear what the Bible says. One, my own professor uh, at the Free University who was uh, honored uh, by scholars in the 20th century by Festschrift, and the title of the Festschrift was Ex Auditu Verbi, from the hearing of the Word. And what, uh, what people miss in the churches today is sound biblical exposition. And, uh, and until we really begin to hear God's Word and the truth of God, uh, we're just, uh, just treading water and being involved in entertainment. But the strategy that God ordained initially, it's God's gospel and it's the power of the gospel is the Word of God. And Luther, in his last sermon before he died, said that the, it seems as if God is the poorest teacher that ever was, because everybody seems to want to improve upon His message and improve upon His way of salvation. But He has invested the power of His gospel into His Word. And as John spoke uh, last night about being ambassadors for Christ, that's the minister's task, is to, is to set forth the Word of God in clarity and in boldness and in urgency. And uh, that, that's the other thing I'm excited about, John, is to see a, a, a renewal of expository preaching. Dr. MacArthur, you had the Inerrancy Summit earlier this spring. And uh, we were happy to come alongside of you to be able to support uh, your emphasis on that uh, with Dr. Sproul's contributions with the Chicago Statement over the years, ICBI, and uh, its continuing need to reaffirm that for the next generation. Um, in like measure, uh, Ligonier is, is pivoting to an emphasis on Christology in 2016. And uh, Dr. Sproul, maybe you could just outline why you've identified Christology as one of the pressing needs for the church to understand today about the person and work of Christ. 
Why is it relevant for the 21st century to emphasize Christology? Well, <clears throat> when somebody asked me earlier what I thought was the, the most significant present uh, heresy that the church faces in our time, it is the person and work of Christ. And in church history, historically, there were four centuries where there were major crises about uh, the person of, and work of Christ. The fourth century, the fifth century, the fourth century gave us Nicaea, the fifth century uh, Chalcedon, and then, of course, the 19th and 20th centuries with the rise of liberalism and neoliberalism, which denied the deity of Christ and, and, uh, and so on. And that's carried over now into our day. And unfortunately, if you watch Christian television, <clears throat> You won't have to watch for more than two hours to see virtually every historic Christological heresy being repeated uh, on the screen in our day. There is an uncanny ignorance of Christology, and that, what that means is that there's an uncanny ignorance of the gospel. I remember several years ago, uh, some folks uh, did a survey at the Christian booksellers convention, there were 6,000 people there, mostly uh, mom-and-pop bookstore owners, and also Christian publishers, people who have a greater than average interest in education. And they were surveyed and asked the question, what is the gospel? And uh, of those who were examining that, uh, the outcome of that uh, survey, they came to the conclusion that 1% of people gave an adequate answer to the gospel. And when I used to teach doctor of ministry programs <clears throat> with our uh, clergy and would be teaching the gospel, I would start my classes by asking the question, gentlemen, let's write on the board your summary of what the gospel is. You were ordained to the gospel ministry. You call yourself a gospel preacher and all that kind of stuff. I said, what is the gospel? And the answer I would get would be, the gospel is the good news that we can live a purpose-driven life, or the good news is that uh, we can have our sins forgiven. Those are good news. That is good news. Our good news is that we can have meaningful uh, existences, and that's good news. And also, but none of those things are the gospel. I said the gospel <clears throat> is basically, objectively, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Subjectively, it's how the benefits of the person and work of Christ uh, are appropriated by the believer by faith alone. If you want to know what the gospel is, you listened last night to the message that we heard from, uh, from John on what the gospel is. It's Christ, what He has done, who He is. And, uh, and again, as I said earlier, people want to improve upon that gospel or say, let me uh, simplify the gospel and tell you this is what it is. And until we understand what the gospel really is, we're not going to make much of an impact on the culture. That's the thing that in the book of Acts, when you see the Spirit working in power, there was the charisma. And if you read the sermons <clears throat> and messages of the apostolic community in the book of Acts, you will see that outline that's there. He was born according to the Scriptures and by the, from the seed of David and so on. He lived a sinless life. He died an atoning death, raised for our justification, ascended into heaven, and so on. You have the central core elements of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. That's the good news. And you can't… In, the church has never improved on that. That's what was lost in the Middle Ages. That was, re, re, was recovered in the 16th century, Reformation. That's what was recovered in the 18th century Great Awakening in New England, and that's what has to be recovered today. I would, I would just add to that, uh, I was talking to Dr. Nichols yesterday a little bit about this, that uh, when I came out of seminary, <clears throat> I, think I, was, I think I was equipped to deal with the issue of biblical inspiration. I think we had been exposed to liberalism and what it was doing to attack the Scripture and attack the deity of Christ. And so I knew there would be some battles to fight. But I, I, was, I was naive on one epic reality that had, literally I have confronted my entire life, and that is that the church doesn't understand the gospel. I, I came out of seminary never thinking I'd spend 
all the energy that I've spent in my life trying to help people who profess Christ to understand the gospel, trying to help pastors understand the gospel, uh, it sort of reached an, an apex uh, by the time I became pastor of Grace Community Church. And when I walked in the door as a twenty-something-year-old at Grace Community Church, my first church, I was so exercised in my soul by the time I got to that church uh, over this issue that the opening message I gave on February 9th, 1969 at Grace Church was how to play church, and I preached on Matthew 7, 21 and 22. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord. I mean, that is not exactly how you start your, your ministry. <laughs> But I, I, this, this, would, this was a serious issue, and, and it was an eruption on that opening Sunday that really has kind of defined our ministry. Years later, the gospel according to Jesus, and then I came back, the gospel according to the apostles. Now I'm in the process of the third in that trilogy, a book that will come out in maybe a year, the gospel according to Paul, then throw in ashamed of the gospel, the truth war. Uh, what, what, you know, the Jesus you can't ignore. And I'm, I'm not writing to this guy on the street. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help people who profess to be Christians to understand the gospel, which obviously embraces the nature of God and the true nature of Christ and His work. And th th this to me is just the, the playing out of Matthew 13 of all that Jesus said about the kingdom being wheat and tares, being a great big dragnet with all kinds of debris uh, as, as well as fish in it, th this, is, this is the reality of, of, of the kingdom that our Lord laid out. Um, that I think, we, I think our Lord addressed it. I mean, you go to the Gospel of John, you see false faith in chapter 2. He doesn't commit Himself to them. You see false faith, false faith in chapter 6. Many of His disciples walk no more with Him. You see false faith in chapter 8. You know, if you continue in My Word, you're My real disciple. You see false faith in chapter 12 when many of the rulers or leaders believed on Him and He didn't commit Himself to them. You see false faith in chapter 15, a branch that doesn't abide, and Judas is a prototype of that. I, I think getting down to the core of the gospel is always going to be the issue. And that means we're always defining the realities of the gospel, the nature of God, the nature of Christ, the nature of salvation, and making that clear. And of course, the Word of God yields that up relentlessly. And if you're an expositor, it, it just rises all the time throughout your preaching ministry because it's so, it's so widely embedded in the glories of Scripture. Amen. Is faith a gift or a response? If it is a gift, why are we responsible for exercising it? Yes. <laughs> it is a response that we have to make a necessary condition for our justification. And yet we are told in the New Testament that the response that we make is because that it's a gift that has been given to us sovereignly by the Holy Spirit who, when we were dead in sin and trespasses, quickened us together with Christ. The defining doctrinal statement about Reformed theology that separates us from all other schools of thought is this, regeneration precedes faith that in order to exercise faith, in order to respond according to the way we were called to respond in order to be saved, we have to first be born again of the Holy Spirit. The vast majority of professing evangelicals reverse the order of that, and they believe that if you want to be justified and if you want to be uh, saved, uh, and, and you, uh, you first have to have faith, and then you're born again. But spiritually dead people can't exercise faith. Jesus tells us that in John 6, you know, that we're not able, we're not capable in our fallenness, in our death, spiritual death, to quicken ourselves. It's only after the Spirit of God changes the disposition of our souls and our hearts that we hear and respond to Christ. So the necessary condition for faith is rebirth, not the other way around. And, and of course, the, the sinner is held responsible for his unbelief and is condemned on the basis of that unbelief, and it's just because that unbelief has produced sin against the holy God. 
You know, it, th this question comes up always, no matter how long you've been in Reformed theology, putting those two together. And I'm, I'm, I'm so very content with the, the mystery of it, the part that I can't understand, with the secret things belonging to the Lord, with knowing that God has a mind that is infinite, I have a mind that is finite, and it's hard to harmonize. And, and I often think about it this way. If, if, I, if I ask somebody, who wrote Romans? Who wrote Romans? Uh, you, you ask a person, who wrote Romans? And if it's a Christian person, there's a sort of, sort of hesitation. Uh, because you don't really know that you can just say Paul because you're afraid there's a comeback to that. Or if you say the Holy Spirit, there's another comeback. Um, it, it, it's all of Paul and it's all of the Holy Spirit. If I ask you who lives your Christian life, um, you're, you're not eager to say, it's me, it's me. I'm, I'm the one who's doing it. Uh, no, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to blame the Holy Spirit for my life. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're caught in that vast realization. It was John Murray who said, in every major doctrine in the Bible, there is a divine paradox. And trying to unscramble that is unnecessary. To, to believe those realities is necessary. A lot of the praise music sung in our churches now asks the Holy Spirit to come. Our pastor sometimes asks him to fall on us. Is this biblical? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the life of the believer um, by divine purpose and sovereign work at the time of salvation. Every believer, Romans 8 9, you know, every believer possesses the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not part of the Holy Spirit, but the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Um, we are called in Scripture to walk in the Spirit. Um, again, that, that's just part of sort of traditional sentimental kind of theology, but we, we, would not, we would not believe if it were not for the Holy Spirit who regenerates us. We would not obey if it were not for the Holy Spirit who enables us. We would not understand if it were not for the Holy Spirit who instructs us. Uh, the, the, there is no possible way that we could, could fulfill any of those responsibilities as believers apart from the Holy Spirit. So people some, sometimes will say, well, what about when, when an Old Testament person says, take not your spirit from me? There, there was in the Old Testament, I think the Holy Spirit, there, was, there were believers in the Old Testament who were regenerate in the Old Testament, who were people of faith in the Old Testament. That was all the work of the Holy Spirit, all the work of the Holy Spirit. But there were also unique anointings of the Holy Spirit that came on individuals for royal service or for prophetic ministry or things like that in the Old Testament. And in that kind of situation, you, you, you might have the coming and the, the moving and coming and going of the Holy Spirit for those particular um, ministries or usages. But in the, in the New Testament, it is, the, it is the believer's privilege to become the temple of the Spirit of God. And that's a permanent reality. There's no more of him or less of him. He's, there's all of him available, taking up residence in the Trinity. I think even going beyond that, if you go through the Olivet, uh, I don't mean that, you go through the Upper Room Discourse, you will find that our Lord himself says that the Father takes up residence in you, I take up residence in you, the Spirit takes up residence in you. For a believer, the triune God dwells in that believer all the time all the time. That, that never changes. So it, it isn't any more of God or more of the Holy Spirit we need. It is to submit to and be obedient to the will of the Spirit as revealed in Scripture. Question about the fear of the Lord. We are told again and again to fear the Lord in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, but in the New Testament it is hardly ever mentioned. In Luke 1, 74, Zechariah predicts we will serve him without fear. Should I fear the Lord now in light of all the mercy he has shown? Uh, Luther <clears throat> made the distinction in answering that same question centuries ago that when the Bible speaks of the fear of the Lord, uh, it speaks not of <clears throat> the fear that a prisoner has who's being tortured uh, by his uh, uh, tormentor, or what Luther called a servile fear, but rather he speaks of a filial fear, the fear we have of failing to honor and glorify God. 
that uh, it, it's not that, that dreadful concept, but rather it's the sense of reverence and awe that you have to have, which is the beginning of wisdom. And that doesn't change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The fear of God is, the, although it's not without trembling. And uh, the New Testament does tell us that we, as we grow, we grow in fear and trembling uh, as we're working out our salvation. So that there's always that sense of awe and trembling before the magnificent glory uh, and majesty of God. And a, and a, a, a fear of dishonoring Him and failing to respect and adoring Him, which is at the heart of uh, the spiritual pilgrimage of every true believer. Yeah, Paul says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Um, but that's fearing God in that, in that sense. We, we fear on the one hand His wrath on the unbeliever. We fear um, in the other sense His… Uh, his his holy expectation of our faithfulness in the dispersion of the gospel. I don't know, John, did you notice coming up I-4 the sign that was by the, that's this church that is put up prominently that says, God is not angry? Have you seen that? No. Only in Orlando can you have that, you know. <laughs> I mean, th th this huge big sign that this church has put up called Grace Church, God is oh, not angry. That's really helpful. Yeah, really. <laughs> I said, except for those who put up signs like this along the road, you know. Yeah. Imagine, a, what, what kind of a gospel do you teach to people to say, there's no anger left in God? What are we saved from? Right, of course. We're saved from the wrath that is to come. Yeah. God is angry with the wicked every day. Exactly. Try that sign in front of your church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you evangelize someone who thinks they are saved but does not show any of the outward marks of salvation? Further complicating it, what if they are family? I think one of the biggest needs we have in the church today is the confusion between profession of faith and the possession of it. I preach about this almost every Sunday to ad nauseum that our people get tired of it uh, because in order to become a Christian, a member of the church, at least in our church, you have to make a profession of faith. And this is what you know, John started his ministry there in 1969 when he preached on Matthew 7. These were the very people that came there and said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And he said, please leave. I never knew you. And uh, again, no one has ever been justified simply by a profession of faith. We're all called to make professions of faith. But Jesus warned that uh, the people can honor Him with their lips, but their hearts are far from them. And so, we, what we have to do is, with those that we love and with those that care about, even though they've made a profession of faith, and they make uh, this, this idea that they show no evidence from it whatsoever. This is what James is writing about there, that these people claim to be having faith and claim to be justified, but they had, it was empty. It was deadly. There was no evidence whatsoever, no manifestation of godly obedience. And, and that's what you have to deal with with people, particularly if you love them. And one of the things that's uh, dangerous is in our great zeal to win people to Christ, we have a tendency to want to help them along, to prime the pump, and do everything we can to persuade men we have our techniques and our methods. We have altar calls or we tell them, well, just read this prayer, say the sinner's prayer, and all of that kind of stuff. But it's easy to get somebody to make a profession of faith. And the danger is to present a false security by using those techniques rather than trusting the power of the Word of God that it alone can bring true faith and saving faith when the Holy Spirit takes it to the heart of that believer. I'm not opposed to preaching for decision and preaching for response. Don't get me wrong. For the fact, last just Sunday morning, 
uh, I, on Monday, I saw one of our parishioners here at St. Andrews, <clears throat> and he came to me and he said, I think that's the closest you will ever come yesterday to giving an altar call. <laughs> he says, three times you asked the question, has salvation come to your house? He says, I was just waiting for you to make the call. Well, actually, he may have been surprised to know that I have given altar calls in the past, but, and I'm not opposed to that. But it's dangerous where you present a false sense of security where people say, hey, you know, I raised my hand, I went forward, I, saw, I said the sinner's prayer. Isn't that all I need to do? I said, no. What you need to do is possess the faith that you profess. If you have that faith, it's going to manifest itself. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. The only, the only legitimate evidence of real salvation is a transformed life. That's it. It's the only evidence. If, if it's not there, then there's no salvation. And to, to, to look at it on the backside, you would expect an unregenerate, unredeemed, unbelieving sinner to behave that way, right? You'd expect him to behave that way, and that's because it's consistent with his nature. But if you have a new nature, if you've been begotten by the Spirit of God, uh, you, you are a new creation, it, that is manifestly evidenced because of your new creation. And transformation is the only test of true salvation, evidence. It's not perfect. I sometimes say it's not perfection, but it is direction. It's the way your life goes toward obedience. I mean, that's what Jesus said in John 8. Whoever continues in my word is my true disciple, my mathetes alethos, the real thing. If you continue in my word, continue in it and living it and believing it and applying it, that's the evidence. If that's not there, then whatever moment you had, whatever prayer you prayed, whatever event you went to is meaningless in terms of salvation. Last question. Each of you, uh, by God's grace, has had a long and fruitful ministry, and it continues to grow in its fruit uh, for God's people. Uh, if you were to wind the clock back and with the wisdom that the Lord has given you over your years of ministry and speak to uh, your younger selves who are just getting started in pastoral ministry, just in one, one sentence, one idea, now, what would you have said to yourself, and by way of encouragement to the next generation of preachers who are coming up today? Don't waste so much time. That's what I would have said to myself. I waste more time than ten people. And uh, <clears throat> there's no substitute for. Uh, immersing yourself in, in the Word and preaching the Word of God and, uh, and instead of growing cold. I listened to S Steve Lawson the other day about Jesus speaking to the Ephesians, and, and, I, and I think about the first year I was a Christian, I was on fire. I wanted to win every person I, I, I met. And I, I grew more, more mature, but I also wasn't as zealous. And I would say, keep pouring the gasoline on that fire. That's what I would say to myself. Um, I, I think we all look back and um, say we wasted time. Um, but, but some of, those, some of those times that we may have thought we wasted because we weren't intensely studying something, we're invested in the lives of people um, for good in the long term. I think for me, it, it would, if I were to maybe do differently, I would, I would try to be more patient. Um, I mean, that's the instruction, preach the word in season, out of season, instruct with all patience. I think uh, as a pastor, young knowing what I knew, believing what I believe. I mean, literally to erupt into a church with Matthew chapter 7 on the first Sunday. Uh, yeah, there was just this passion that needed patience. And um, 
developing that patience with people to allow the work of God to go on in their lives uh, would, have, would, have been more, would have been more effective and endearing for me in those early years of, of so much zeal. Uh, be patient. It's the work of the Lord that's going to be done in the hearts, and it's done over a long period of time. Um, it's amazing how long. I've been at Grace Church over 45 years, and I can look back and realize now how it's almost imperceptible to see the transitions and the transformations as people grow and develop over a period of time. You, you, have, to, you have to see many years to really see that happen. So I, I think patience would be probably something I really could have used a lot of in the early years. Like you, I've been impacted by these men that the Lord has raised up to serve His church in our day. Could we give Him the glory and express our thanks to these gentlemen for being so used over the years? <laughs> 